Welcome everybody and thank you for being here tonight. My name is Arlene Steffi. I'm the chair of the Mark Seminar Series and our guest tonight is Philip Flores. He is the president and CEO of Bank Pacific. If you allow me to explain a little bit about Phil. Phil is a family friend of ours. I've met him and became closer to Phil through my husband Bob. They've been buddies for a very long time. But I handle the advertising for Guam Savings and Loan, which is the company that became uh, Bank Pacific. And Phil is the only son of the only son. So he is the only grandson of our first Guamanian governor, Joseph Flores. And I had the distinct pleasure of producing the doc documentary on Governor Flores which was pretty enlightening because there was a lot of information about the governor that I knew nothing about until our director now, Monique Sori, asked me if I would take over the project, which was a seniors project here at the University of Guam. So it uh, turned out to be very um, exciting because there were people that were involved in the history of Governor Flores ended up being people I knew, and that's really a lot of times what happens if you've been here long enough. You know a lot of people that are involved in these projects. But um, tonight, Phil is going to be talking about political status or banking under a different political status. And the MARC uh, seminar series, our purpose and function is to be able to take these uh, educational platform take advantage of this educational platform and to explore the avenue of these topics that affect our communities. And so we invited Phil to participate in this series of lectures that started with Phil Carbolito um, talking about judiciary in an independent Guam. And Phil tonight will speak about banking under different political statuses. And then Jerry Paris will come in next month and he will talk about tourism and its effects on uh, different political status. So there's a series of um, topics that we will be discussing, but um, if you would uh, like, to, I would also like to tell you that this, is a, this delay happened for two reasons. We had a typhoon that came through and Phil was supposed to speak to us last month. And so we bumped Lee Weber to next year, to 2020. But Phil also just returned from um, his daughter's wedding. He has two children, Breeses, and he will introduce his son. But Breeses uh, recently got married, and so Phil has just returned from that. And with that, I ask you to welcome Philip Flores, President and CEO of Bank Pacific. Well, I'm overwhelmed by my humility by the, the attendance tonight. <laughs> but no, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I thank Carr for inviting me to do this. Uh, you mentioned uh, my daughter. Yeah, she just got married October 19th, and I have a daughter and a son, as Ars said. I think of in my adult life uh, of the top three events, four events, uh, the wedding of my daughter was one of them. Two of them were the birth of both of them. It's one of the things I wanted to talk tonight, not just about political status and self-determination or decolonization, but how do we make our community such that our children have something to come back to. My daughter's not coming back. Uh, she's a specialist and she's a doctor and a specialist and the opportunities aren't here for her. And so many of it, we all have friends. We all have family, children, parents living in the States because they, there's not something here for them. And I'd like to see what we can do to bring people back to Guam, to have our children stay here, to have people who don't, who don't live in Guam say, hey, that's a kind of a cool, sounds like a cool place. I'd like to live there. And it's not just political status. There's a lot of things we have to look at. I personally, I try to build my life on these 10-year plans, trying to figure out where I'm going to be in 10 years. Um, I think as we're going through this process of self-determination, it's where do we want to be 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Because if you go out more than 100 years, you're just pretending it because you don't know 100 days, let alone 100 years. But at least in the back of my mind, if we can try to plan like that way. My grandfather was governor. He uh, had an inaugural speech, July 6, 1960. And he talked about self-determination. I read his inaugural address today. He talked about self-determination there. And he was quite proud 
that we went from Navy to Interior, and 10 years later, we have a governor of our blood. And that was a great step. And then we had Richard Titano with Concon in the late 60s, and then we, of course they had the Concon in the early 70s, but we really haven't gone that far since then. I remember I, I was chairman of the Republican Party when uh, Joe Adams was running against Madeleine Berdallo, and the governor would automatically be the chairperson of the Commission on Self-Determination. Well, because nobody wants to write a party platform, I did it. And I put in there that the chairman of the Committee on Self-Determination should be a tomorrow. And I think it was KOM who caught it, and they asked me about it. And it became a big deal. It was in the PDN that, you know, you're asking for this, and oh, how racist. And I said, you know, in the Philippines, would that somebody who's not a Filipino head of uh, self-determination? Do you want somebody from, oh, I didn't say Minnesota because that's where Madeline's from, but do you want somebody from the states who doesn't know really about Guam to be chairperson of the self commission on self-determination? I got battered a lot in the press, but I'll tell you, when I went to the meetings or even with friends, I'd have a lot of people, especially when I'm going, come up to me and say thank you for saying that. And that's one of our things today. As we go forward, and we have the Davis, the Davis uh, lawsuit, are we going to be able to have a plebiscite where everybody has to have some tomorrow blood in them, or somebody who was born here, maybe their parents came over after the war for the construction business from the Philippines, they can't vote? I don't know what's going to happen with that. I think, frankly, we should have a vote, even if we can't make it just for tomorrows, to let everybody have a, have a say in it. In the second Con Con, one of the 70s, I think it was Pete Paris was chairperson of that. But I do know Judy Guthridge was a prominent member of it, and she's been a prominent member of our community for so long. Are you going to be, say to people like Judy, you can't have it? Or do you say people, to people like Bob Steffi, your wife can vote, your children can vote, but please stay home and watch TV? I don't know the answer to that. I personally think that we've made the decision already. The fact that it's been 50 years since our second Con Con, we haven't really been able to get the energy to get it going. We do right now, and that's happened before a couple of times, but how long will that last? And in the meantime, we have more tomorrows living in the States than we have living in Guam. So people have made, in my mind, they've made their vote with their feet, and they've moved to the mainland US or Hawaii. They made their choice about whether they want to be independent or want to retain their citizenship in some form by keeping their American passport and moving to America, mainland. They've made that decision whether they want to be a territory, status quo, or live in a state by going and living in a state. Oh, when I said that, our current quest just started. No, at the, Arlene reminded me of the Chief Harau. Kapua, so I think it really did start centuries ago. So what are our self-determination choices? Uh, it's proffered by United Nations. We can do free association. We can do independence. We can do statehood. Frankly, if we ever do get to a vote, I'd like to see status quo stay on there, too. And what does that mean? Because ours asked me to talk about what it means in, as it pertains to banking. So what are, again, our choices, and what will it do to banking or the economy in general with our different choices. Can, can, I, can I just ask a quick raising of the hands if people want to tell what they would prefer? Who, who would like to have statehood? Who would like to have status quo? Who would like to have independence? Or free association, which is just another form of independence? Okay. I don't mind status quo, and as far as independence or being freely associated, I wouldn't like to have that. I'm proud to go around the world and tell people I'm an American. I like my American passport. I like dealing in the U.S. dollar. Uh, we forget how strong the U and well accepted the U.S. dollar is. If you go to Vietnam, you don't spend Vietnamese dong. You spend the U.S. dollar. Five years ago, I had uh, the opportunity to go to North Korea. You don't spend whatever it is I have over there, you spend the U.S. dollar. That's just part of the benefits of being an American, and I don't want to give that up. But let me give a brief background of banking in Guam. 
and then we can talk how it will affect us. This is after the Spanish-American War and the United States uh, bought Guam and the Philippines and came on in and started ruling us. And in 1915, they started, this is the Navy, started the Bank of Guam. And they continued to have it until the war, and then shortly after the war, when the U.S. took a, re, repossessed the island, our community, they started it up again, the uh, new Bank of Guam. And then, as we were trying as a people to go from a true colony into a territory or closer relationship with the United States, uh, we went lobbied in, in Washington, D.C., as you know, and then there came the Organic Act, and we moved from Navy into Department of Interior. And at that time, the Navy started getting rid of their assets and moving them into the civilian sector. My grandfather uh, joined the Navy in 1917. He was discharged in San Diego, moved up to San Francisco, met my grandmother, and had my, my father, their only child. And then after the Second War, he moved back. He had two brothers, he had no sisters, two brothers. Um, they all had different fathers. The, um, he hates Guam. Um, but they, my, my great grandmother died when she was 26. Uh, and my grandfather's doctor, a father was a doctor on a whaling boat who wasn't here. And he was raised by the Paris family. And I was with Felix, Governor Felix Camacho's mom in, in my office. And they, and she was talking about how when they were young, they would run from where the Bank Pacific is in Aganya to the, the palace over there and play. And it re then I just realized that right then, this is where my grandfather grew up, right there in the middle of the 151 Aspinall, although I don't know what they call it back then. When he was in San Francisco, he started several newspapers. They were neighborhood newspapers, advertisers. You gave them away for free, and you make money on it by having advertisers who would pay you to put their name around. So when he came back, his brothers talked him into coming back. At that time, where the bank is now, was a general store called Flores Brothers, kind of like a Luhans little store. And the economy was just going crazy because they were rebuilding after World War II. There, there wasn't really, we've all seen the pictures, there wasn't really much left of Agania after, and other parts of the island after the, uh, the, uh, we retook it from the Japanese. So when the Navy was getting rid of their assets, they wanted to sell the newspaper. So my grandfather grabbed a couple of his buddies, Guerrero, Calvo, Camacho, Perez, and they uh, bought the newspaper. And my grandfather was a majority owner, he was a publisher, he was the editor, and he came out with the Guam Daily News, which was Monday through Saturday, and then on Sunday, the Territorial Sun. So we had our first civilian newspaper, at least on a, off a printing press ever, and my grandfather put that together. He later sold it to Chin Ho in Hawaii, and Chin later sold it to Gannett. So at that time, the Navy was also getting rid of the Bank of Guam, not the Bank of Guam we know today, but the Navy-owned Bank of Guam. And they put that out, and my grandfather put together his same buddies, and they went to say, hey, we'll buy the Bank of Guam. And the Navy said to him, off, actually it was the controller, said, no, you guys don't know anything about banking. So they sold it to Bank of America. Then at that, that same time, my grandfather had a good friend in San Francisco who had a savings and loan association. His name was Elwood Hanson. So he went to Elwood and said, Elwood, how do I do an SNL? So he told him. So on July 7, 54, uh, my grandfather opened up the doors for Guam Savings and Loan Association. And right next door was Mariana's Finance, because at that time, savings and loans could only make loans for houses and the finance company could make the $500 or $1,000 loan to individuals. And it was in the building where uh, the PDN was, uh, or back then the Guam Daily News, and uh, so it's that, now it's the DNA building, it's in that area over there. We moved to where we are now in 1966. I wanna talk about the other two local banks in a second, but the history of banking on Guam is such that banks come and go. Right now we have ANZ, we have Bank of Guam, we have ourselves, we have First Hawaiian Bank, Bank of Hawaii. Over the years, I know it was great satisfaction my grandfather had when Bank of America left 
sold to Bank of Hawaii. I know as a local banker, we're happy when we see Chase leave, Chase Manhattan Bank, Bank of Tokyo left, Union Bank of California left, Metropolitan Bank left, Bank of Tokyo left, most recently, Citibank left. So the point I'm trying to get there is we sometimes think of banks like our water and our power. That's always going to be there. Well, at least most of the time it's going to be there. Okay. But, but they don't. Banks go. Money is fungible. If it's not profitable, that bank is going to pick up and it's going to leave. So the three local banks, ourselves, and actually ANZ, I should say community, uh, Citizen Security Bank. In 1973, Sus Guerrero, Jose Leon uh, Antolan left Bank of America and started the Bank of Guam. They had a lot of people there from the old Bank of America. And this is before 10 years, 13 years before Bank of America left. But they, uh, they brought them over so they knew banking, Bank of America had trained them and they've done a great job. And I think it was the 80s or early 90s that Kurt Moylan, former Lieutenant Governor Kurt Moylan, put together his buddies and he started Citizen Security Bank. Well, it's not that anymore. Now it's uh, ANZ. The decisions are made out of Melbourne. Again, I'm just trying to get to how tenuous the banking industry is, not just in Guam. When I started in the industry, there were like 18,000 banks in America. Now it's like 5,000 because they just go away. They get merged into somebody else or they go out of business. Um, they, a lot of banks in, in the 80s, several banks went uh, broke. In the early 2000s, several banks in the States went broke. You could tell it was Friday because there were announcements coming out. This bank or that bank or this bank or that bank had been taken over by the FDIC or the OCC and somebody else was gonna be running them on Monday. They come in at closing time on Friday, take care of it. It's kind of like a raid in, in the, the CNMI. They, they come in and they get one there on Friday and then on Monday they open it up with a new, new sign out in front for the new bank. One thing about regulators, whether it be the FDIC or the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the OCC, they are very, very strict. And they are very strict about who can get into the, who can, who can do banking and if you can do banking, what you can do. Because they have the FDIC insurance fund where, like we hear FDIC insured, what does that mean? It means if you're a depositor and if that bank goes broke, you'll be able to get all of your deposits back up to $250,000. And there's different ways to layer that structure so you can get more than $250,000. But the point is, the federal government is making sure you, as a depositor, to have faith in the banking system, know that you can get your money back. It has the guarantee of the United States Treasury. Well, it's expensive to have to pay somebody $250,000. Doesn't happen very often, but it's expensive to have to do it. So they're gonna make sure that those banks don't go broke. We get examined for what's safety and soundness every 18 months. And examiners come in, they look at our loan portfolio. Are we healthy? Are we making money? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing, not breaking the laws? Are we helping our community? They just won't let anybody come in and do a bank and, uh, unless they follow their rules. And there have been banks that have failed in our area. Uh, the most recent one was down in Palau Pacific Savings Bank. It did not have federal insurance, so a lot of people lost a lot of money on that. And I'm, now I'll get to what I think it would happen with our, with our choices. And I'm going to say there's four choices. I'm going to add uh, uh, our status quo to it. And so I'll start with status quo. Well, if there's nothing changes, the banks in Guam aren't going to change. Nothing, the economy is going to stay about the same. Um, the only thing we have right now is that Sometimes we're considered fish rather than fowl and vice versa. For instance, if your, your visa card and your debit card, if we issue them here in Guam, they are a, an international card. If you issue them in, in uh, California, it's a domestic card. You know, the differences are slight, but as far as revenues and what you can do with your own system are different and it makes it harder. So if we went to a state uh, as, as California is, then we become, at least in that sense, uh, domestic instead of international. I'm assuming that's the case because 
It's Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, American Samoa, CNMI, and ourselves. If you're issuing cards from there, then they're considered by Visa and MasterCard to be international. So if you become a state, I'm assuming then that we're going to be treated domestically, as a domestic bank would be. The rules to play the game would not change. If we went to freely associated or independent, I'm going to lump them together. We can't, we can't be freely associated unless we're independent. The rules are going to change. I mentioned the examiners come in and talk to us about safety and soundness. R mentioned that uh, this was originally scheduled to take place last month. The examiners were in town last month um, when the typhoon happened, which was so fun because they always talked to us about we had to be prepared for storms. And it was great to see the look on their faces when we said, you know, we've got a typhoon coming. Uh, one of the guys, actually, the lead examiner, grew up in Saipan. He went to harvest here for five years, so he wasn't afraid of the typhoons. But he sat down and we talked about what would happen if we became independent. So we took an example and we looked at the Marshalls. And the, the trust territories, you know, there were four districts, CNMI became America, Palau, Independent, Marshalls, the FSM, Freely Associated. And there was a special provision in the covenant agreements that allowed them to keep FDIC insured deposits. In fact, we went into Palau, Bank Pacific did in 1997, 1998, after Palau had become independent, and we were able to open up a branch there and have all of our deposits insured by the FDIC. But today, when the FDIC looks at our, our balance sheets, they do not count the deposits that we keep in Palau. We don't know why, uh, but they don't do it. And I would have to think it's the same way for Bank of Hawaii and Bank of Guam will also have Palau branches. Bank of uh, Guam has branches in the FSM and the Marshalls. But the economies there are really, really weak. And they do not, especially the Marshalls, uh, this is not a reflection on Bank of Guam, it's just a reflection of reality. Uh, the banking, the bank financial services are really insufficient. You're not going to have a bunch of ATMs around. You're not going to have a bunch of abilities to wire money internationally because anything goes outside of the uh, marshals are going to international place uh, from their perspective. You're not going to be able to do what the banks do right now. So if we became independent, somehow it would have to be negotiated in our new compact or our new relationship with the United States that first, the deposits here right now continue to be, for, for the existing banks, continue to be FDIC insured. Because if Bank of Guam and ourselves lost the ability to have insurance on our deposits, hey, we're going down the river. Uh, we, we won't be able to last. You if you want to have a deposit where it's insured or not insured, you're going to go where it's insured because it's just safety for you, no matter how strong we are. It's just common sense, especially for people coming to the island because we have a real transit community here. As you know, people come and go, come and go, come and go, come and go. And if I'm coming to the island and I can get an insured account from one of the Hawaii banks, but not from the Guam banks, I'm going to the Hawaii banks, which just spells the eventual death spiral for the local banks. That's one of the reasons I don't, I'm totally not in favor of independence and breaking away. Uh, because if we, just under the assumption we had the ability to do it, uh, I'm not sure how far the U.S. government would go in letting the, the banks to here. Plus, you have to ask, the central bank, the United States, our central bank is the central bank for the world, basically. Don't think about the World Bank or the IMF or anything like that. The U.S. central bank is the big daddy, and it would no longer be Guam's central bank. We'd have to have our own central bank. Uh, I don't think we could have the ability to do that because we've talked to Plow about doing that. Set up a central bank. They don't have the expertise. They don't have the dollars, expenses, the dollars to put into an investment. A couple years ago in Palau, they had so much Chinese money coming in, literally in suitcases, and they were crisp $100 bills, crisper than the ones we buy and, and distribute. And none of the banks, the FDIC banks, Again, Palau's Bank of Hawaii, Bank of Guam, ourselves, we wouldn't accept any of their money because we didn't know who they were. I mean, some people come from China, you don't know if that is their first name or their last name. You don't know where that address is or really what that company is, and you can Google it. And 
You can't really always find it. So if you don't know your customer, it's a big deal since 9-11. If you don't know your customer, because they're trying to stop terrorism, they're trying to stop drugs, um, they're trying to stop you from doing business with North Korea and Iran and Yemen and all that stuff. If you don't know your customer, absolutely, uh, you can't do business with them or her. So the president, Romengasau, was talking to the three FDIC banks saying, come on, take this money. He says, we can't. And so the OEK, which is their Guam legislature, or no, their Guam House of Representatives Senate, passed a law that allowed the Palau National Development Bank to take deposits. And the Palau National Development Bank is a development bank. It's not an operational bank, a retail bank that is set up to take your deposits because you, you don't just take your deposits. You come in and give us cash today. We don't just stick it there in the vault forever. We, cash is very expensive just to sit on. So you try to reinvest it. And if you can't reinvest it, then you're in, in a loan. Then you're sending it off electronically off island to the Reserve, Federal Reserve Bank, Federal Home Loan Bank, or you're buying treasuries. You're doing something with them. Well, the National Development Bank hadn't thought about that. Palau hadn't thought about that. They thought they could just take the money from the Chinese guy to the development bank and put it into the FDIC bank. And all the FDIC banks said, no, we don't want it. If we don't know where your money came from, we can't do business from you, with you. So that was passed three or four years ago. It has not been implemented for that very reason, which gets to the regulation and money laundering. I'd say 10 or 15 years ago, our, our region, not, not Guam, our region was really red flagged by the IMF, by the FDIC, by the World Bank for money laundering. And still, every once in a while, in fact, I got a call from Ray Gibson on this uh, early this week, or last week, uh, because the Euro uh, European Union still considers Guam to be a tax haven, where you can escape taxation. So people don't understand our region. We are not a tax haven. We pay the same taxes a bank would pay in California. You pay the same taxes you would as an individual in Montana. That's just, that, we're not a tax haven. But if we weren't properly regulated, and people f already think, think that there's uh, money laundering in our region, they're going to think that Guam is a place for money laundering. And if we don't have strong regulation, and I mean strong regulation, uh, there's going to be money laundering in Guam. Because there's just so much money flight capital coming out of Asia, whether it be from China or somewhere else, trying to get out of their countries before the government takes their money. And they, they bring it to Guam like they brought it to Palau for a while, uh, and nobody's here to regulate, then then we're going to be in the middle of money laundering. We already see money laundering, but you catch it. And if you catch it or you suspect it, you notify the federal government right away. Bill. Yo. Question. What is the threat of money laundering? You said we could ask a question in the chain. What is the threat? Well, when you, if, you, if you accept the money, you're saying you're not accepting the money. There's a reason you're not accepting the money. What would happen if you did accept the money? And what is that threat to the bank? If we accept money and we suspect it, and we're not checking to see if it's a, a money, money that's being laundered, um, there, there's civil penalties up to $500,000, there's criminal penalties up to 20 years in jail. And the ones responsible, if I'm an officer and I'm, I'm kind of like doing this stuff and nobody's supposed to know about it and then I get caught, well then I get caught. Now if the bank's doing it systemically and a lot of people are doing it because we just haven't set up the policies and the procedures, then your executive officers, the members of your board of directors, they're going to get stung. Which is why banks have something called directors and officers liability insurance, because things can go wrong every once in a while. Not necessarily criminally, but just something might go upside down, so you get insurance for that. But do you know insurance helps you on the civil side, it doesn't help you on the criminal side. And the do you know things actually say, if you're doing something that's illegal and you know it, you're out, it's like driving drunk. You're not going to get a, be able to get a claim if you get in a wreck. And the, on the other side, first I thought, what was the danger of money laundering? Um, because that might not be so obvious, but it's, uh, yeah, it's how criminals move money around, uh, whether, they, again, they be terrorists or whether it be drug, uh, drug dealers, that type of thing. And there's different ways to launder money. It's not just who's making the deposit today. It's who we, who's borrowing money today. Maybe I'm going to uh, launder money by borrowing money from you to buy a house. And then all of a sudden, a year later, uh, you, you borrow 250000 All of a sudden, a year later, 
we pay you all with cash because we already had that 250000 Bitcoin's a big money laundering possibility. The casino in Saipan is a big money laundering possibility. Um, I don't know if it goes to probability after last Thursday, but the, uh, it's been thought that all along. Like the Tinian Casino, they got fined 63, $70 million, something like that for that. I personally think that if we went to independence, it's not just going to affect the banking industry. I think it's going to affect our entire economic community. And we, we have interest in various different businesses. And I think that if uh, we became independent, that all of those businesses would suffer. I don't think people would come in and invest. Guam has a classic case of capital leakage. By that I mean, we go to Payless and we buy something that Payless bought from California. So we pay Payless, Payless pays California. It's not like we're paying the farmer Molesso for it. We're paying some distributor in San Francisco or Long Beach, wherever the case may be. That's capital leakage. That's money leaving our community going somewhere else. So what we really want to do is have new capital brought in through investments to people who are building, uh, people who are starting a business here and they're going to fund it. Um, that, that's what we want. And if, if we have independence, people don't have the protection of the American courts. They don't have the central bank. Um, it, I think our economy would suffer tremendously. I know our economy would suffer tremendously. But it's kind of where I started. What can we do to make people want to come back to Guam, to want to stay to Guam, to move to Guam? You know, fresh, fresh insight. You go and you live in the States for a while. You come back with new ideas that we don't know here. Um, and this just makes us all more prosperous. Plus, I'd love to get up in the morning and see my daughter down the street. How do other small countries that have become independent, uh, is, is there a country you like that just, if, if, if you were willing to make up, you know, those, uh, you created a laundry list of things that make the American banking system strong, right? Uh, but there are other bank, there are other independent countries that bank, but not with the U.S. banking system. So as you look around the world, are there small, what, how do small independent countries I don't know. But you know, the, one of the, the things that, like the British Virgin Islands, as opposed to the U.S. Virgin Islands, they did make an tax haven. And so they had a lot of offshore companies go there, and their banking system was very big. You cannot call Iceland, I guess, a small country, especially it's, it's emerged so successfully from the, uh, the early 2000s, the financial collapse then. But they, uh, most of their banks at that time were from Europe. And actually, when Iceland went upside down, European banks went upside down. They've since, since established a very strong Icelandic bank or whatever, Bank of the Iceland. Uh, that's how they've done. But yeah, a lot of small places, they, they don't have a good banking system or they try to link into someone else. I don't know who would link into us. I can't see Japan linking into us. I can, I'm, I can see China because China's trying to go everywhere and grab whatever they can, not through guns, but through, through, uh, through, through cash. Can you define a um, tax haven? And, and would Guam benefit from being a tax haven? I don't think so. A uh, tax haven, well, you know, Switzerland was a tax haven, and they had to correct that because they were getting beat up by the EU. Um, but a, a tax haven is like the British VI, Virgin Islands. It's a place where you can come and set up your company and uh, bring repatriate money from other, that you've earned in other countries and park it in that country and escape the taxation on it and then eventually you would take it and put it somewhere else. I believe it's the FSM who's doing a little bit of that right now. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if it's the FSM or the Marshalls, but uh, Simon and I have a friend, Norman Zoller, who's part of that hui, and the main guy, Norman used to work for Citibank, the main guy used to run the region for Citibank in the 70s and 80s, and uh, they put together a group and they didn't invite me. What? No. And uh, so that one's been very successful, but they're taking money that uh, would otherwise be paid in taxes in, uh, in Japan, and it's going to the Marshalls. I'm pretty sure it's the Marshalls. The Marshalls gets a piece of the action, their hui gets a piece of the action, and then the rest goes back to the Japanese companies. Okay, so I have a question that if we were to seek to go the independent route, um, you had talked about um, 
that a central bank would be necessary. Um, do you see within our banking industry now, do we have the potential in terms of personnel and knowledge to create a central bank? Absolutely not. And, and, and it could be done. I mean, Palau's looked at it. As we were talking about maybe sometime they could do it. We're much more developed uh, economically and politically mature than Palau. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's really a specialty. And if you go to like the Federal Reserve Bank in, uh, in San Francisco, which I've been several times, or it really is what you would think Fort Knox would be. It's, it's a fortress. They have a big lobby. First off, you can't drive your car anywhere near it. So you can't rush in there with a car bomb. Uh, but they have a lobby there, and the fellow's pointing out, see all those beautiful windows? Yeah, there are machine guns behind those. Well, and if you go to their vault, the vault is like four or five floors underground, and then the heck with ADA, you gotta walk down another set of stairs to get into it, and then it's a big room and like multiple doors to get in. And they, they it's, I mean, you have really specialized people running those banks, there are PhDs, or they're, no, I don't think we'd have the ability to. You could always buy the ability, have, hire people, but I don't think the economies of scale would make sense for us. That was actually leading to the follow-up question I have is, so what would we need to do and how long do you believe that it would take us to get to that point? I don't think we could get to that point. Um, because I don't think our economy under independence would, would, would blossom anymore. I think it would, go backwards. And the ability to fund, the ability to attract, if, you know, if I'm, if I'm a guy who could be making two or $300,000 for the central bank in, in Atlanta, I'm not going to come out to Guam where they can only afford to pay me $85,000. And they don't have the systems, they don't have the electronics, they don't have the, you know, I'm not going to come do it. But the, I think it takes a massive amount of capital or money circulating to need central banks and we just wouldn't have it. Maybe it could be built into the agreement that we are allowed to continue to use the U.S. Central Bank. I, I don't know, but if we left on our loan, I don't think we could do that. So if we were under independence, then more than likely the United States may not necessarily see any benefit in us being a part of the Central Bank. I think it'd be more than just that, Monique. I think they'd say, wait a minute, you don't want us to be there anymore, but you, want, you still want us to bring you fresh fruit every morning? You don't get it. it. I know, I don't think they'd be going out of their way. I don't know what it is, it, what would be the benefit to our country. I say our country probably is an American to give independence to Guam because the, the military bases are very strong and necessary. Uh, it's good to have an American presence out here. The Japanese who come here, the Ch Koreans who come here, they don't come here because it's all Guam. They come here so they say they, can, they came to America. I mean, it's very plain. And, and when you talk to them or talk to them when they do the surveys, they like the fact that they can come and say they've been to America. And, you know, we're, we sometimes get so, oh, man, our President Trump, what a buffoon. Everybody around the world hates him. Uh-uh. I, I just came back from Portugal talking to, they like him. If you look at Hong Kong, the protests going on right now, they like them. They just don't like it in California, New York, Maryland, all those places, and some people here in Guam. Um, so now, thinking about from the free association standard, if we were to approach the uh, FDIC and, and ask them to be included as an insured bank, what are the insurance factors that we would need to be to demonstrate to the FDIC in order to um, have them say yes, they will continue that? I think the deal would be that you have five FDIC banks out here right now. They are all uh, they are they are all financially strong, good capital positions, good earnings. So it's, we're not reinventing the wheel. We would just be asking them to keep using the wheel for us, but would they allow other banks to come in and put risk to the insurance fund? I don't know. Is there a benefit in other banks coming in? You mentioned a litany there of all the, all the other banks that have left Guam. And the only banks that continue to be on Guam are the banks that are local banks and ANZ. But it, and, and the Hawaiian banks, but they are really like, been here forever. So if, what is the benefit to Guam if 
we, under a different political status, um, to remain under FDIC, other than the obvious, which is ensuring the investments. How does Palau manage to continue its economy? I mean, I know you said earlier that they really don't have a, a economy, but they're thriving in tourism. They have, they have things that theoretically we don't have on Guam. So what are we missing that they have that we would benefit if we changed our political status? Okay, I read the Island Times almost every day. Uh, they went through a huge boom about three years ago when the Chinese were walking down the street with suitcases saying, R, can I buy your house? And they're going to pay you something that looks tremendous to you because you haven't seen that much money before, but really it's just a pittance. And what do you do? You go to Disneyland, you come back, you don't have that much money, and you don't have a place to live, and it's too expensive to buy another place. Palau's economy is very, very up and down. I sometimes talk about Guam's economy being a demitasse. It's a small cup of coffee that you can spill out and the economy is suffering, but you know it doesn't take very much to fill it back up. Plow is a thimble, and it can go upside down or right side up so easily. So Plow was, it's only been since the 80s that they've had a real economy of their own as opposed to uh, being part of the United Nations Trust Terry uh, ship. Um, but they, they have a very, very, very fragile economy. And to get their compact road built, that was done by the Japanese. Uh, the Chinese, Taiwan especially, has been giving them a lot of grants. They get money from the IMF. Uh, but they are, uh, we enjoy doing business in Palau, but there's not a lot of development in Palau. There's a hotel here for the Chinese, a hotel here for the Chinese, built by the Chinese, owned by the Chinese, manned by the Chinese, manned and women by the Chinese. Uh, and then they get their tour boats and they copy what the locals are doing. And they have the tour boats run by the Chinese. That's why about four years ago you had a bunch of the Chinese tour boats being burnt in the middle of the night. Um, so I, I, I don't want, Guam does not want to be like Palau. Maybe ecologically, because they do take care of their island much better than we do take care of ours. But financially, uh, economically, no. We're like a thousand miles ahead. I have a question, where do you guys have to do your banking? Is anybody a Bank Pacific customer? Yay! <laughs> All right, anyway, it's a pleasure. Um, I hope I was able to at least depart one or two things in you that you'll remember. Uh, again, I am at Bank Pacific, and if you ever have a question or if you ever need a financial service, uh, I'm gonna give you my direct line right now if anybody wants to write it down. It's a four seven seven two six seven one, and my cell is six eight seven six eight seven seven. Please, no calls after nine o'clock at night. Yeah, just text. Yeah. Did you serve? Did you serve on the GMH board by any chance? I was chairman of the board for four years, and as I always say, we could have fixed that hospital if it wasn't for the doctors. Really? <laughs> and is that still the answer today? I don't know, but I, uh, I mean, I could go on about the hospital for a long time. When I was there for the four years, we reduced the number of FTEs by about 20, 25%. After I left, it went right back up. It is, a, it's just, they have way too many employees. And Which government agency doesn't? I don't know. We did, when I, I was chairman of the board for the Port Authority for eight years, we did the exact same thing. You don't have to fire people, you just to treat. Mm -hmm. You don't fill all the vacancies. So that's the problem with our government. It's over employed. Well, okay, so uh, Simon's heard this from me a thousand times. That's government. I mean, if you don't like the government of Guam, this is our government. We elect these people. Uh, you know, we go up, we give them money. Uh, you know, or if you see them come in with the tickets, you're running high. But no, sometimes they catch you and you have to buy the tickets. But what other government do you want? Do you want California's government? Do you want Illinois' government? Do you want Washington, D.C.'s government? Oh, the federal government can do it so well. Like, heck, they can. You know, their deficit is the greatest it's ever been, growing more every day. The corruption within the federal government, the fighting, nothing's going on in Washington right now because the administration and the legislature, especially the House, they're just at loggerheads. And who suffers? The people of the United States of America. Yeah, but they keep... Uh, they keep elected them. That doesn't address the deficit. It doesn't address the fact that our government continues to have a deficit. If the government
government of Guam became streamlined because of... Okay, so I'm, I'm going to go to today's newspaper. Okay. I'm not sure which one it was, uh, but it was about if you shut down cabers two and three, or whatever the numbers are, that so many people are going to lose their jobs. As though, oh my gosh, this is what we're doing to people that are going to lose their jobs. Well, isn't that what you're just asking me right now? How do we make people lose their jobs? They don't have to lose their jobs. You don't have to fire somebody so they're going to go to civil service commission or something like that. When they retire or they resign, you just don't fill that position unless it's necessary. It's like on holidays, they say the only necessary position will be open today or whatever it is. That's like saying, oh, the other 90% of government is not necessary. And a lot of it is not necessary. But if you have to get votes, you have to get votes, so you hire people. When I was chairman of the party, not only were people phoning me up saying to get them a job in the government, which I said, no, I won't, but they go, you know, I canvassed with you. Can I get a loan? So I'm not the governor of Guam, no. See, that's, I think that's the mistake. So you can run it as a healthy entity, but when you do, you do it at the expense of not paying them the same amount that they would get in the government, which is why people gravitate to the government. That's part of it. But I think if you're, if you're also in the, in the private sector and you're doing a good job, then you start getting paid some good money. You don't have to worry about who's going to be governor next uh, November. And you don't have to worry about, is your senator going to be reelected every two years? Uh, you can work your way up and you can jump around to a new company too. You don't always have to stay with the same company. But again, it's not, it, it's when we phone up uh, like Tall Tales or Patty or anybody and they complain about the government over and over again. I say, Patty who? Patty, Patty, Royal. Okay. Anyway, the, uh, the, you know, I say, stop complaining about the government. You're the ones who put it there. Or, do, or don't complain, do something. But it's just government. All governments overspend, all governments over, over promise. Okay. Well, Phil, thank you very much. Hey, thank you, everybody. I, I had fun and I hope uh, you enjoyed it.